American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Annie Chambers Ketchum, an accomplished woman of letters about whom, strangely, it is really difficult to find out much. <laughs> You're not kidding. You first found out about her story and told me about her a few months ago. And as we've poked around the internet and done some deep dives into books that are digitized, there's not a whole lot out there. Now, that's not to say there is no story there. Just that the text of her letters, speeches, and many other writings that normally would be available simply can't be found. All we found were some of her poems. And those are quite nice. Okay, we should probably get into what we could find of her story before we convince any more of our listeners to turn off this episode. Yeah. Okay, so Ann Eliza Chambers, known as Annie, was born in 1824 in Scott County, Kentucky. Scott County is very near what is known as the Kentucky Catholic Holy Land and Bourbon Country which is where we'll be leading a pilgrimage in August of 2021. Yes, it's going to be a great time visiting the places where Catholicism grew west of the Appalachians and some of the great distilleries. Find out about that in our show notes. But Annie's family were not bourbon makers. No, her mother's family, the Bradfords, became prominent as the publishers of the first newspaper west of the Appalachians, while her father had had a military career and was a lawyer. She was afforded an excellent education, and she frequently could be found reading books that were normally considered too advanced for a child of her age. She was tutored at home and was an excellent student, excelling at mathematics, languages, what we would call creative writing, and the natural sciences. She graduated from Georgetown College for Women, and then shortly after her father died when she was 20, she married her first cousin, William Bradford, and they had two children. But the marriage didn't last long. No, Bradford apparently was a drunk, and either they separated and then divorced, or Bradford died. It seems more likely from what we read that he did die. Either way, Ketchum was a single mother with two young children, so she and her children moved to Memphis, Tennessee in 1855 when she was appointed principal of an all-girls school. She began giving lectures to raise money for more advanced equipment for the sciences at her school had she had taken lessons in public speaking from Charlotte Cushman, a famous actress known for her full contralto register, which essentially means she could talk really deeply and she could do roles that either men or women could do. And in 1858, Annie Chambers married again. Yes, this time to Leonidas Ketchum, who was 11 years her junior. Annie started a literary magazine called The Lotus in 1859, and through it and other publications began publishing her own original poetry. Her poetry was positively received and appreciated for its tight and straightforward imagery and rhythm. She wrote about her children and about nature. In 1873, the Lexington Press wrote about her poetry, Mrs. Ketchum's Christmas ballad, Benny, has become a household song in all lands and alone would immortalize her. But her later poems bear evidence that she has been an earnest and enthusiastic student. Semper Fidelis in the October number of Harper's Magazine is pronounced one of the most finished productions and Dolores, Waiting, and Amabere May are gems of the finest type. But everything shut down with the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, including her magazine Lotus. Now, we should make clear she wasn't a Catholic at this point. No, she was still Protestant well into her adult life. So her husband, Leonidas, became an officer in the Confederate Army. And at the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862, he was badly wounded and would linger until September of that year when he died. So she was a widow again. Yes, but while Leonidas was still alive and in a military hospital... Memphis fell to the Union, and two very momentous things happened. First, Annie, because of her reputation as a poet, was approached to write new lyrics to the Confederate national anthem, The Bonnie Blue Flag, which she did dutifully. Her lyrics became the official lyrics and became very popular very quickly. And because of that, the second momentous thing happened. Federal officials approached her about taking the oath of allegiance to the United States. Since her husband had fought and was in the process of dying for the Confederacy, she couldn't very well do that. So she and her children were banished from Memphis and had to move north, back to her hometown of Georgetown, Kentucky. 
When the war was over, she returned to Memphis to find her home destroyed. She and her daughter set up a new school for girls, but the good times were not to come and remain. In 1867, her son unexpectedly died of cholera, and this appeared to be what finally really rocked her. Not the death of her two husbands, a bloody civil war, nor banishment from her home, which was destroyed, but when her son died, that seemed to be what caused her to reevaluate things, and she left for a time to live in Europe. Right, including time in Paris. It was while in Paris that she became Catholic in 1874. Unfortunately, we couldn't find anything about her process of conversion, her thinking about conversion, nothing. But what's interesting is that while in Paris, after her conversion, she became a Dominican tertiary in 1876, taking the religious name Sister Amabilis. Then, after a few years of living in Europe, she returned to the United States, but this time taking up residence in New York City. So she went from being a Protestant, lifelong Southern lady to being a Northern Catholic and Dominican tertiary. And she brought with her into this new phase of her life, her poetry and her writing abilities, her passion for educating, lecturing, and publishing. And to these other abilities, she added another, botanist. Yes, one very notable accomplishment was the publication of a scientific text called Botany for Academies and Colleges, consisting of plant development and structure from seaweed to clematis. This book was widely used and was very respected for its thoroughness and scientific approach, plus the careful drying of the plants, drawings which Annie had done while spending time in the gardens of Europe. You actually found a review of the book in which a scientist of the day marveled that such a fine work of science and technical ability should have been produced by a woman. It was something. Uh, she wasn't formally part of groups fighting for rights and recognition for women, but she certainly demonstrated that women weren't incapable in intellectual pursuits on account of being women. And unfortunately, that's pretty much where the narrative about her life ends. We weren't able to find more about what she did after this in the time before she died. We do know that a nephew of hers, Benjamin Chambers, also became Catholic in 1894 and was ordained a priest in New York, so we presume she had some influence on him. We also know that as Sister Amabilis, she would wear her Dominican habit on Catholic feast days, and she was buried in it when she died in 1904. But to round out this episode, we're going to read a couple of her poems so you can get a sense of the spirit of the lady, Annie Chambers Ketchum. I'm going to read A Mother's Prayer, which was one of her earlier poems, inspired by watching her two children go to sleep. A Mother's Prayer They sleep. Athwart my white moon marbled casement, with her solemn mien, silently watching o'er their rest serene, gazes the star eyed night. My girl, sedate or wild, by turns, as playful as a summer breeze, or grave as night on starlit southern seas. Serene, strange woman child. My boy, my trembling star the whitest lamb in April's tenderest fold, the bluest flower bell in the shadiest wold, his gentle emblems are. They are but two, and all my lonely heart's arithmetic is done when they are counted. High and holy one, oh, hear my trembling call. I ask not wealth nor fame for these my jewels. Diadem and wreath soothe not the aching brow that throbs beneath nor cool its fever flame. I ask not length of life, nor earthly honors. Weary are the ways, the gifted tread, unsafe the world's best praise, and keen its strife. I ask not that to me thou spare them, though they dearer, dearer be than rain to desert, spring flowers to the bee, or sunshine to the sea. But kneeling at their feet, while smiles like summer light on shaded streams are gleaming from their glad and sinless dreams, I would my prayer repeat. In that alluring land, the future where amid green stately bowers, ornate with proud and crimson flushing flowers, pleasure with smooth white hand beckons the young away from glen and hillside to her banquet fair. Sin, the grim she-wolf, couches in her lair, ready to seize her prey. 
The bright and purpling bloom of nightshade and acanthus cannot hide the charred and bleaching bones that are denied taper and chrism and tomb. Lord, in this midnight hour, I bring my lambs to thee. Oh, by thy truth, thy mercy, save them from the envisioned tooth and tempting poison flower. O crucified and crowned, keep us. We have no shield, no guide but thee. Let sorrows come, let hope's last blossom be by grief's dark tempest drowned. But lead us by thy hand, O gentlest shepherd, till we rest beside the clear, still waters in the pastures wide of thine own sinless land. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to close us out with Ama Bereme. When the white snow left the mountains, when the spring unsealed the fountains, when her eye the violet lifted, where the autumn leaves had drifted, neath the budding maple tree, Amabereme. Now the summer flowers are dying, now the summer streams are drying. Yet I cry, though lone I linger, where the autumn's wizard finger burns along the maple tree, Amabereme. As the wild bird, faint and dying, follows the summer faithless flying, so my heart, doubts blank air beating, broken winged, is still repeating, while it follows, follows thee, Amabere me. Soon will winter, gaunt and haggard, shroud a new grave, sodless, beggared, still, though not a flower be planted, not a requiem be chanted, not an eye with tears be laven, on a gray stone will be graven, neath the leafless maple tree, Amabere me. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review and support the work of SQPN. Your support at sqpn.com slash give helps make sure American Catholic History and all the StarQuest podcasts remain available. To find out more about Annie Chambers Ketchum, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at sqpn. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest.